you have stolen about two and a half thousand dollars worth of hotel points. And worst of all, you have put me in a middle seat. On a five hour flight. Oh my God. And they just let you do it. Yeah. F them. So I am here in Las Vegas for two of the world's biggest hacking conferences. And for some reason, I have agreed to be hacked. I'm meeting Rachel Toback, who specializes in a special form of hacking called social engineering. And I'm very nervous. I feel like I know pretty much everything about you. I instantly don't trust you. So am I gonna be safer today, thanks to you? You and every other customer will be safer today, thanks to what you're willing to let me do. Well, let's get started, I guess. Okay, so you want to assume that everything that you put on social media is public. Information that can be found in places like this can be used to authenticate you with different companies. Do you remember this tweet? Yeah. I use this to gain access to your current address. What? So what I did is I called up this furniture company right here, and I basically said, hey, we're gonna buy another one of these pieces of furniture, but I need to make sure that I don't accidentally have the wrong information on the account. And they said, no, I mean, you ordered something a while ago, but the thing that you ordered, we shipped to this address. And yeah, I, I think I got his updated address, which is pretty scary, because that happened in 30 seconds. I got your current address. I got your birthday from Twitter. I called like pretty much every business that he ever listed that he used on his Twitter or Instagram. What you have to understand is when you do that, I now know which companies you use, and I know which companies to call as you. What did you get from the boutique hotel? Your phone number and your email address. They gave you my phone number. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna be doing these phone calls. I'm gonna be actually live hacking. So when I call, your phone number is gonna display on their caller ID. This is Joni O'Sullivan. Who are you really? <laughs> No, this is, this is Donny O'Sullivan. I can tell you my address, phone number, date of birth. Whatever, whatever you need to know to verify, verify that, that that's really me. me. That's wild. I am on the road right now and I'm having trouble getting access to my internet, but I need to transfer points to my friend for a bridal shower. Hopefully you can help me out over the phone. I have all the information. I have 90,000, is that correct? So the first and last name is Rachel Toback. Oh, they've been transferred? Okay, fantastic. They're gone. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Are your points gone? They're gone. That is crazy. When you call this airline, it's gonna be coming from my number. Yes. As you know, I have flight leaving Vegas. I'll put you in the middle. I'm trying to do this like personal essay thing, so can you move me to a middle seat, kind of in the back of the plane? I know you probably don't get that request a lot. Oh, perfect. Okay, so it's a row right before the last row and it's in the middle seat. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You're in the back of the plane, middle seat. <laughs> I had an exit aisle. I know. He picked it up saying, Mr. O'Sullivan, how can I help you? If I was not sitting here with you and didn't know, they said, well, sir, you called up and requested this, I would flip the f out. <laughs> I love that video, Rachel, and I'm sure everyone is going to go and scrub their social media after this session. So hello, <laughs> everyone, and welcome to the first ever Verona State of First Forum, the Hackers and the CISO, Mindset, Methods, and Mayhem. We're really excited that you all could join us for today's event. The Data First Forum is a new style of event Veronis is introducing this year. Each quarter, we're going to be bringing in expert voices from the IT and security industry for thought-provoking, actionable discussions about how you can protect your mission-critical data. And of course, we plan to have some fun along the way. So a couple of things before we get, before we get started. Today, we'll do a live Q&A towards the end of the session. So please add your questions to the Q&A window throughout. We'll get to as many of them as we can. And if we don't get your question, one of our experts will reach out to you after the event and get that answered. Also, today's session is worth CPE credit. So if you've not earned CPE credit with us before, please send me an email. You can just respond to one of the 10 I've sent you and include your CPE information and we'll take care of it. So with that, I'd like to hand things over to our field CTO and moderator for today's panel event, Brian Fetchy. It's over to you, Brian. Thanks, Ashley. And thanks everybody for taking some time to join us today for our first Data First Forum. Uh, I'm pretty excited about this one. Um, we've got a great panel, uh, some of which, some of whom I know, some of whom I don't know yet, uh, but we're gonna have a great discussion about data. So uh, our agenda is pretty straightforward. 
we're going to have a panel discussion and we're going to do a live Q&A. So keep an eye on the chat. And if you've got questions uh, about anything that we're talking about, either ask it in the chat or even, even easier for us, ask it in the Q&A window uh, and we'll get to it at the end. So with that, I want to introduce our panel. Um, Rachel Toback, who if you were here on time, as I'm, I hope you were, uh, is uh, is a is the CEO of Social Proof Security, a friendly hacker, chair of the board for Women in Security and Privacy, uh, Women WISP, uh, and obviously the star of the video we saw at the top of the uh, of our webinar today. David David Jackson, veteran pen tester and podcast host of Infosec Unplugged, and Ed Amoroso, CEO of Tag Cyber and former CISO at AT and T, and also moderator for a panel that I was on once. So. Rachel, David, and Ed, thanks so much for joining us today. Everybody here, say hi. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hey, how you doing? Excited to be here. Nice to see you all. Great. So let's dive in. We're going to start by talking about the mindsets and motives of hackers, what hackers actually look for. And Rachel, I think what <laughs> off the video we just saw of you hacking CNN, this is a great place to start. So how long does it take you to get the data that you use to hack Dhoni? Uh, how quickly were you able to use that data maliciously? You mentioned you called every company. How long does this actually take? Well, unfortunately, not too long. Um, I found the data that I needed to hack Tony within a few hours on social media. So specifically his Twitter and Instagram. And I was able to use the data maliciously that day. So started by doing things like pressure testing his service providers. I actually never contacted Tony during the attacks at all. I contacted his service providers on his behalf. So getting a sense of what authentication protocols and identity verification flows they have through their customer support channel, specifically the phone, um, and getting a sense of, okay, what kind of questions are they asking me about myself to see if I spoof uh, his phone number, make the caller ID look like I'm calling from him. If I use a voice changer, can I just use his date of birth, address, phone number, email address to be able to gain access to his account? And unfortunately, on most of those flows, that was possible. So the majority of those companies are using knowledge-based authentication, KBA, rather than MFA, multi-factor authentication, which allows me to perform account takeover extremely quickly. And of course, he gave me consent to do this, but you know, this is really an important thing for most people to understand that you know, if, if you're not in the public eye, this is probably not relevant within your specific threat model. Uh, but it is good to know that if you have a lot of information about the services you leverage on social media, that if you do have an elevated threat model, you know, you're a journalist, politician, an executive uh, in the public eye a lot, that this type of thing is possible. So real Ed, quick, did, did, did he, I was going to say real quick, did he actually take that flight in that seat home? Yes, he did. <laughs> yes, I, that was so he signed the contract and he understood that it was possible that some of the stuff was irreversible. That and one other thing was completely irreversible. Um, I transferred a bunch of points to myself through, we'll just say a coffee point program. Um, and that didn't actually make it into the video because it was completely irreversible. And I felt so bad uh, that I was able to take those and I wasn't able to give them back. That's a bummer. No more coffee he was, for Donnie. He was forewarned. <laughs> uh, Ed, if you were the CISO uh, of an organization that got hit by something like this, uh, either one of your employees or obviously you got hit by some social engineering and you got hit by a hack, what would you do? It depends. You know, I've been looking at these types of things for 40 years. You know, back in the day, it was just a different type of attack. Um, I remember Kevin Paulson. Uh, hacking uh, Rick, that goofy Rick D's guy in the in the seventies and eighties sang Disco Duck. He had a, a radio call-in program, and he broke into some Pac Bell switches and hacked the eight hundred number database. So nobody knew what the real number was. He called and went won a Porsche. I think he won it the second year too, and he got caught. But but for my whole career, I've seen mischief. And here's the problem. Sometimes there's something you can do about it. And I think in the case that Rachel cites, she's correct to point out that there are a lot of things that people can do, but sometimes there isn't. I'll give you a very macabre sort of example. Let's say we walked over to a railway area and I walked up to somebody and I didn't really do it, but I pushed them and then held them and said, look, I could have pushed you into that train. And we will all go, oh my God, uh, that's a terrible vulnerability. So the question is, what do you do? Like, do we shut down trains? Like you can't just put up those glass doors all the time. So sometimes there's no good solution. So what happens 
is because of these weaknesses in the way we put things in place, you end up having a very unpleasant experience. You end up not being able to get your, um, your flight changed because they don't trust you. Um, you get, I end up not being able to get an attendant on the phone because the attendants are too easily social engineered. You sit there for two hours. That's when there's nothing to do. Um, but sometimes there is, like in the cases and what we'll be talking about today is that you know, technology in many cases does allow us to make progress and improve it. So as a CISO, you have that very uncomfortable moment of, okay, we've got a vulnerability, now what do we do? Do we shut something down? Do we do something baroque and unpleasant? Or are there technology solutions or other solutions that would, would work? And it's not always a, a good answer. Now, sometimes it is, but sometimes it's not. Devin, how often should companies be thinking about running advanced social engineering scenarios and, and combining physical security testing with, and with phishing and other types of human centric attacks. Obviously having someone like Rachel run through this scenario would be relatively expensive, I assume, but you know, how often should people be doing these kinds of things? Uh, well, first, thanks for having me. Uh, honor to be here with Rachel and Ed. Uh, and to answer your question, um, it, it really, as far as the phishing, I think there should always be continuous uh, phishing tests or social engineering tests, especially with the climate of the world today, with all the phishing attacks that we're getting in real time. And uh, they're actually getting a lot better uh, as far as crafting those those messages. So I think it's important to keep you know our staff members or our teammates um, well informed of the phishing attempts. And we should actually do that on a you know, a fairly regular basis, it should be a lot more than just, you know, twice a year, just to kind of fill a compliance need. Um, I think, so I think that's definitely uh, important. And uh, as far as the physical testing, uh, I know a lot of companies will say, you know, we have nothing here, or it couldn't happen to me. But I definitely think that there should maybe at least annually have like a full on engagement of, of a physical pen test. Um, to go along with the phishing exercises, uh, just to just to kind of show the security posture of that company. Um, a lot of people think it can't happen to them until <laughs> until it does. So um, yeah, I think I think a combination of you know maybe I'd say quarterly or so with the phishing, and then maybe like a annual or semi annual for the the more the physical and the advanced testing. I think regular. Go ahead, Rachel. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I, I think it's super important that people understand how they react in real time to social engineering. The other thing that I sometimes say is people will ask and reach out and be like, hey, can you pressure test our systems? And I say, when was the last time you updated them? Um, when was the last time you updated your protocols and your support flows and your technology? Does everybody use multi-factor authentication that matches their threat model? If they have admin access, you should probably be switching to FIDO security keys. When was the last time that you rolled that out? And if they haven't rolled out some updates recently, then I would say, let's sit down and talk about your protocols, flows, and technology before we pressure test it. Sometimes people are like, can you just test me right now? And I'm like, I could, but I'll get in in five minutes. Is that what you want? Because that's, that's not helpful for you. It'd be more uh, useful for you to update your flows, and then we can test it after that. Uh, and so I think, yeah, I agree with uh, Davin that you got to test and you got to do it frequently, but we got to make sure that you've updated your flows first so that I don't just get in immediately. Davin and I are just going to get in in five minutes, right? Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's you, you're going to get in no matter what. I, it's funny. We do phishing tests, obviously, we regularly. And the more often you do them, the more you're training people to look out for them and, and be more responsive to them. But they're always going to be successful to some extent. There is no 100% successful uh, phishing simulation, somebody's going to click on that link. And I did it once when they said there was an expense rejected, for instance, uh, and I got really pissed off. Um, what about how cyber attacks have evolved? So the OctaSAS report uh, finds that large organizations have on average 175 SaaS apps, and the complexity is compounded with each new one. We say here at Veronis, we've got about 200, and we're not that big. We're, you know, we're a few thousand people, um, and about 20 of them are core to our business where if you know if they were to go down or, or compromise in some way that would materially affect our ability to, to 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 work as an organization and with SaaS applications there's you know they're all built for collaboration you know it's designed in ways that you know where you can access them from a web browser and we can share with anybody who needs to 
in order to collaborate. And each application has its own configuration stack that's constantly changing. And they're all connected by APIs. You know, if I can get access to Okta, assign myself access to GitHub, go find an API key, uh, and then use that to access Salesforce, I've just moved laterally from application to application. Um, so, Rachel, with the increased use of cloud collaboration tools like 365 and Box and G Drive, how has that changed the game for CyberTax? Yeah. Well, you mentioned a really good lateral movement. I, I like that. Um, these cloud collaboration tools, they allow us to do easy actions like simply requesting access to a document, a shared folder, and employees are so used to just granting that access because they're expected to do it ASAP, right? That's an expectation within the company um, that they don't always check who I am first and that I am who I say I am. So um, if I can gain access to your cloud, your collab tools, then I can see a lot of your docs and a lot of your protocols and processes all in one place. And it's sometimes even more valuable than getting a presence on a machine because so many things are stored in the cloud right now. Um, and all of these services are connected to one another. So that being said, I do want to also mention um, that cloud collaboration tools allow you to revoke access, which is uh, a thorn in my side because someone will accidentally share me on something and then they'll be like, oh my God, wait, who was that? And then they'll revoke my access and I'm in the middle of trying to download it or gain access. So um, I do say that if you're going to share something super sensitive, like your uh, important all hands deck from last week with someone who's requesting access, sharing access to that with the a cloud link like box or something like that, where you can revoke access after rather than just attaching a PDF or something like that makes it much harder for me to continue to gain access to things. Um, so there's a, a bit of a challenge on both sides, right? Granting access really quickly, but also you can revoke access really quickly. Ed let me add, just kind of a follow up to that. It's funny, we talk about cloud data stores and collaboration. I think it, traditionally we've thought of, I need to really protect the access points, the phones, the, the, my devices and my laptops. But it, as a CISO, if I were to give you a choice between having a data repository, like a file system or 365 compromised versus somebody loses their laptop, which one would you choose? Like which, which is the bigger risk? Well, it depends. Tell me what's on the laptop, and we'll and then and then we'll decide. Um, but I I mean I, I sort of in, enjoy the example here of cloud. Um, I believe that you're never going to find any configuration that doesn't have residual risk. There's no such thing as running something that will be perfect. I mean, you can drive your car and you can cross lanes into someone, and then everybody says. Why, what were you, an idiot? You didn't put barricades on every road on the planet? Because look what people can do. Look at this risk. But we accept it because we that's just the way things go. The way to look at cloud is not to compare it against perfect, but to compare it against the mess that we had with enterprise cybersecurity just a few years ago with perimeters that were buggy and didn't work and talk about lateral traversal. I mean, it's kind of a joke, you know, when we tried to hide behind a DMZ um, and it didn't, it, it was basically like police tape. So I personally, I share Rachel's concern that there are certainly risks. We can always make things better. But I think when we compare SaaS and cloud with good cybersecurity tools around it, like managing entitlements and making sure that we've got good posture assessments, we know the situational awareness and setup of the accounts and who's doing what, even watching the traffic to our SaaS and cloud. I love that. And that's way better than the kind of crap that we used to manage not that long ago. So I, I don't measure against perfect. I measure progress. And I, I really believe SaaS and cloud are a step forward as opposed to a step backward. Davin, what sort of holes do you look for when you're doing a pen test of an environment with multiple potentially and maybe even probably interconnected SaaS applications? Uh, well, I think you kind of touched on it earlier with, uh, with APIs, but um, you know, I look for any type of web interfaces, uh, uh, especially with um, APIs, going back to APIs. Uh, are they configured properly? Um, are they doing what they're intended to do? Sometimes there's some business logic vulnerabilities where they are created to do something and the developer may not have um, anticipated that it could be used in a malicious way. Um, so, you know, you're looking for a lot of di different misconfigurations to exploit. How can I leverage this, uh, you know, 
and, and it's not fairly uh, difficult to to do uh, with with pen testing for for APIs. A lot of it is just <laughs> curiosity. Um, another thing you can do is uh, check the source code. Uh, if you're really good at reading and writing code, uh, you can check the source code and see if there's any vulnerabilities in the source code and um, leverage a vulnerability or an exploit that way. Uh, so there's a lot of different things. I mean, you can go the traditional route, you know, trying th things like scanners and things like that to, to flesh out other types of vulnerabilities and follow the OWASP model, whether it's the OWASP top 10 for web applications or the API top 10, that's, that's uh, fairly new. So like I said, it's, this, it just all depends on the application, what APIs are running, what interfaces, what, you know, what do you see when you're actually you know, on the system or on that, on that web, web application. And when you're running a pen test, do you think your job is done once you've either established a foothold or even escalated credentials? Or escalated privileges to get access to, you know, obviously more data and systems, or do you actually take it a step further and go try to find sensitive, sensitive data, sensitive information, and see if you can exfiltrate it without tripping an alarm? So um, it all depends on the scope and the rules of engagement. Um, I was taught early on that if you're on a pen test, the moment you take data from a system, it no longer is a pen test, it becomes a data breach. Right. So uh, I, I tend to stay away from uh, actually exfiltrating. However, I'll do a, you know, a really detailed proof of concept and say, I have the, I have the capability or um, I could create a file and pull my own file, um, depending on how, what, what kind of access I have. Um, I, I definitely don't <laughs> want to uh, pull anybody's data or PII or anything because that's when it's kind of like, you know, that that's a big no, no. So you want to avoid doing that. I agree with Davin on that. Um, for social engineering pen tests, I mean, of course, it's all about the scope, right? But a lot of times I try and help my clients understand that you don't want a data breach, you don't want me to exfiltrate all of that stuff, you don't want me to have all of those passwords, I can just show you that I can do it, you don't need me to actually have that stuff. So um, a lot of times we'll set up if we're doing like an account takeover scenario, for instance, and I have to take over customer accounts, we'll set up two to three fake accounts on the back end that for all intents and purposes look real to the support folks. Um, we usually have one of them on the inside so they can make it look real. And then I take over those accounts by leveraging those flows and systems so that I don't actually breach a real customer account. I'm breaching fake customer accounts that look completely real. And that's a good way to avoid an actual data breach. So kind of taking this a step further then, and, and this is for everybody, in your experience, um, do companies, organizations, enterprises put enough focus on limiting actual data access or are, are any of them, are we still stuck in the, and Ed, you're, you brought this up, the mindset of protecting the perimeters is, is enough. I need to big, build a big and powerful gate and hope that I keep people out. Uh, do you see that organizations are putting enough focus on actual data access? It's uneven. We saw Twitter, like, remember they had the breach and we all rolled our eyes. There's obvious cases where a bad decision has been made, but it's not easy. You know, the, those kinds of things in a larger company are hard to get your arms around. Um, so you do a merger and acquisition and all of a sudden you're married to some new company. You don't know the first thing about it. It could take you quite some time to figure it out. So it, it's, it's not easy, but I think you do point to an important sort of cleanup activity um, inventory and understanding what it is that you're actually running and what you've got is um, important. The challenge is that pen testing is not the way to do that. Like pen testing is a good way to jog people to action. Like Rachel's piece on CNN is good because a mainstream audience sees it and it kind of freaks them out a little bit and might cause them to take some action. But in an enterprise setting, pen testing is only useful when there's a group that's not acting because you, you, I, we just already assume that we're vulnerable. Like if you took the Fortune 500 and showed them all Rachel's video, there would be no action because they already know that. They already know this stuff or else they wouldn't be in that position. So the challenge here is that what do you do? And I've come to the conclusion that um, IT infrastructure, the kind of things that Verones does in fact, um, are, are the right kinds of solutions, getting back to the foundational basics, learning your inventory, setting policy, making sure you're finding loose ends, 
having good um, procedures and practices um, that in many cases are highlighted by, by pen testing. Laggards in a business unit, for example, when they weren't listening to me, I'd bring my pen testing team, rotate their tires a little bit, show them what, make it very visual for them, the kinds of risks that maybe they weren't able to understand. And that pushes them to action. Pen test is designed specifically to produce action. It's, it's there to make people do something. And mainstream, it makes them get a little more aware. In business, it's to wake somebody up who ought to know better. But, um, but to fix the kind of thing, Brian, you, you talk to, it's really a tough job and it's not very sexy work. It's uh, IT administration and inventory <clears throat> and access management, the kind of thing that um, you know, requires a lot of discipline and a lot of organization. Uh, I, I agree. I agree with Ed that uh, there's definitely should be inventory and administration uh, that happens first, and penetration testing um, should be complementary, right? It, it, like Ed said, you know, this is the policy, and then the pen tester should come in and say, this is what happens when you don't follow that policy. Uh, you know, one of the things that we tend to look for um, is, you know, is easy. Uh, privileged access. So, you know, when, when a company starts out, especially with startups that kind of blow up overnight, um, you know, everybody has, <laughs> you know, the highest level of access that they can be given. And as the company grows, um, they forget about doing things like, you know, adding security groups or, you know, least privilege access, or if a person or if an employee leaves the company, um, did we actually revoke that access? Did we actually disable that account? Um, I've been on pen tests where we've seen people with high level um, privileges and they haven't been with the company in months. So um, definitely having um, a least privileged policy, um, active inventory of all of your assets, I think that would go a long way. And yeah, and then bringing in a pen test to, to, to get on top of that uh, would definitely help. Yeah. Yep. Ed mentioned the Twitter breach, just to give folks a scope scale in the audience, in case you didn't know, 1,500 out of 5,000 people at Twitter had admin access, the level of access necessary to do and complete that attack that happened to Twitter uh, in 2020. So especially hard during COVID with everybody out of the office requesting access and it being granted, just to give you a sense of scope, a company that works super hard on their security, takes security super seriously, still had 1,500 out of 5,000 with that level of access. So go back to your teams and get a sense of when was the last time that we did that access management inventory? Like how many people do have that level of ad admin access um, before a pen test comes in? That's, you want, you want me to come in after you fix that, not before. It's also, it can be really tough to fix too. You were talking about, you know, collaborating in 365 and, and you, you want to grant people access um, it, that's really hard to do in a single SharePoint site. Anybody who's ever been an, an on-premises SharePoint administrator knows just how hard it is to make sure that once people start collaborating, things are locked down. But in 365, you'll have more SharePoint sites than employees. So you know, right. it can be really hard. User training is important and, and making sure you've got good perimeter controls are important, but the, the complexity, the scale of trying to make sure that people only have access to what they're supposed to can be really, really tough. Um, and we've also, I, I've been asked a lot of questions today, obviously, with what's going on in the rest of the world about, you know, how do we protect ourselves from kind of more advanced threat actors to, uh, you know, nation state actors and advanced persistent threats. I think one way to think about this is that you assume you're breached, Ed, as you said, assume breach. And if we assume we're breached, then and we assume that a threat actor is in, what does that mean? That means, well, we can't, we can't always just look for sig signatures because they're going to leverage zero days and unknown techniques. We need to look at the behaviors that are going to help us actually identify when the assets that we're trying to protect are uh, accessed. So with that, let's talk about methods and how we can best defend ourselves. Ed, the incentives, obviously, to commit cybercrime are out of control uh, and they're, they're continuing to grow. It's easy to become uh, a, 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 you know, a RAS affiliate. Do you, you don't have to know how to write malware and you don't have to make and, and you don't have to know how to write the malware in order to make serious money from it, to, to monetize it. Crypto makes it hard, it's not impossible, but it makes it a lot harder to get caught, right? You can anonymize, uh, you, you can anonymize the monetization of cybercrime uh, pretty easily. And cyber companies, or companies and cyber insurers continue to pay ransoms. 
because they need to get their data back. They need to get back to work. So what has to change in order for commercial cybercrime to slow down? Well, a couple of things. First off, I would say cybercrime is just one piece of the um, malicious equation. Uh, nation state attacks don't care about taking your money. <clears throat> As we you know, see brewing sort of out in um, uh, Eastern Europe right now. So, so st start with this basic premise that um, an adversary is going to have a whole range of different motivations, ranging from, you know, the mischievousness of youth. And I, I sort of think of like a yeah, yeah, hacking sort of in the DEF CON kind of setting as not being malicious. Like I think it, that's not even something that I would consider to be um, on the negative side of the, of the balance sheet. That's a good thing. Most of the time when it's done responsibly, it's a good thing. But at some point, you know, I think um, the, Davin and Rachel had alluded to the fact, well, maybe at some point it crosses a line. It's like a breach. Like if I knock you out in a pen test, that's bad. Again, that may not really be malicious. It might have a negative consequence. And then you continue along the spectrum. They may be trying to get credentials for money or to embarrass you, or it's a hacktivist group, all the way up to and including a nation state that'd be happy to kill thousands or millions of people. You hack a nuclear power plant in New York, uh, have it spin out of control a la Stuxnet, and a million people die. So all of that range of stuff needs to be factored into the equation when you're protecting systems. So no CISO, there isn't a single one in industry who starts by saying, I need a point solution for ransomware, or I need a way of stopping social engineering in my uh, call center. They all do the same thing. They build a culture that tries to do whatever makes sense, best practice, going way beyond best practice if you're a nuclear power plant, whatever you have to do to reduce the risk, and it's a range of risks. It could be like, I come from telecom, so our primary goal was to make sure your iPhones and your Androids worked, but still didn't want to lose customer data. So you had to do both. You have to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. So, so questions about cybercrime and, and ransomware and stuff like that immediately go to the, 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 the thing that we all do when we're playing defense is that we build models and patterns. For example, I'll bet Davin and Rachel would agree that a ransomware attack is more like a campaign than just this thing that happens. It's more oh, step absolutely. by step. And if you lay it out, APTs and ransomware attacks, they have a lot in common. There's a lot of things, the stages of that attack. It's not that old dopey Lockheed kill chain, but it's more modern. The steps are kind of common. So when you think about that, you, you put things in place like good solid identity is the way to, to you're going to knock off 20 things with that, right? So, so it's usually not, Brian, that you say, just like when you go to the doctor, they don't take out the physician's desk reference and check to make sure you're not going to get all these diseases. That's dumb. You, you do things that, that handle a whole range, a whole broad range of risk. And a lot of the best practices we've been sort of alluding to, you know, good inventory identity, we'll get into some more. Right, that's what you do. You don't really match the, the, the defense to a specific attack, because if you do that, then tomorrow when Rachel or Davin invent some new thing, then you're gonna look like a deer in the headlights. So you really have to think more broadly when you're playing defense than on offense. They're two very different games. So with that said, uh, and this is for everybody, uh, what do you recommend doing? How would your strategy in 2022 change versus what it would have been in 2012, for instance? What well, specifically zero, would you tell people to do? Yeah, zero trust is a really good idea. And it's, it, I don't know that it's an idea so much as a condition that when you realize that the perimeter is a bunch of dopey police tape, like it's just a joke mm -hmm. that it just keeps good people out and anybody, you know, Rachel, dad want to get in, they just get in. Once you realize that, then you take this mindset that nothing should be trusting anything else. No entity should just assume based on the a VLAN proximity or we're both in the same building or are we both, you know, whatever, we're in some, some country. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Like proximity and other things don't, are not the basis for trust anymore as they might've been 15 years ago. So that, that causes good behavior. That makes me want to encrypt things. That makes me want to micro-segment things. That makes me want to use identity as a control. That makes me, all of those nice things happen as a consequence of adopting that mindset. That's why I feel like we're making progress. 
I didn't say risk is zero. There's still a million things you can do, but I'm just saying we're making progress and zero trust is a better model than perimeter model. And maybe there'll be something new 10 years from now, but I, I feel like we're sort of getting it on the defensive side. We are getting smarter. And, I, and I, like I said, I, I don't know what Rachel and Gavin think, but I really do think that uh, adopting a zero trust mindset in your SOC, in your IT team, in I, IAM, and in call centers and other things is a pretty good idea. And, and I think it reduces risk. No, um, I agree. And I, I saw there was a question about uh, zero trust and I don't want to jump ahead, but um, I, I think I think Ed is right in the sense that it is a mindset. Um, however, you do have you run into issues where, you know, people have that convenience versus security debate. Um, and that when you try to implement zero trust and everybody isn't on board or shares that mindset, then you have things like shadow IT. Um, so, I mean, you have to get everybody on the same page. It, there has to be, you know, 100% agreement across the board. So, uh, yeah, that's just my we saw We saw a lot of organizations when they started moving data into 365, for instance, do things like shut off all of the sharing, the ability to collaborate with others, because like, this is the most secure way to do it which just meant that everybody just found a way around it uh, and was, you know, using their personal Gmail accounts or something. So the more yeah. restrictions you put in place, sometimes the more uh, the complicated you can make things. Um, I mean, I, to share a story one time, I, I tried to do something like that and lock down the network. It was for a school system um, and I had the teachers union come after me. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it, it just comes with, it comes with the territory. You have to find yeah. that happy medium somewhere. And that's why I think it's so important for, security organizations to employ user experience specialists, people who have that level of expertise. Um, before I did security, I actually used to do UX research and a handful of other things like working in a rat lab, which is a story for another day. But I never would have imagined how essential it was to understand you know, error management and people understanding how to get support, how to get help, where to go, um, and how to take the right actions that you have to nudge people in the right direction and that not everyone's going to adopt everything overnight. And if you really want adoption overnight, you kind of have to flip a switch. Like what we're seeing with Google and Twitter and their research with multi-factor authentication, you know, turning on two-factor or two-step is what Google calls it for a handful of users and seeing how do they react? What goes wrong? What's the problem? Um, and yeah, sure, there's plenty of problems, there's plenty of issues, uh, but they're seeing a huge adoption rate and people are staying safer and it's lessening uh, issues by the 50% for account takeover for Google. So um, there's so many actionable steps we can take. We just got to do a little bit of research and understand from a user experience perspective, what's it like for the people who are using this and trying this. So with that, Let's move on to Q&A. If you've got a question, please ask it in the Q&A window or the chat window. There's a bunch that have come in and I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of go through these and, and, and send them out either to the group or to anybody in particular. Um, I'm gonna start with Rachel because this one is fun because uh, part of your video where you were uh, hacking Dhoni is you were spoofing his phone number and using a, a, you know, a voice modulator uh, to, to, to change your voice. Any idea how to block spoof phone calls and texts or prevent that kind of thing from happening? Yeah, there's some, you mean block the ability to be spoofed or block receiving spoofed calls? Either or, let's okay. take it from both ends. Let's take it from both angles. So um, you can't stop somebody from being able to spoof your phone number. That is not under your control. Um, now the telecom companies can pre prevent that. They prevented spoofing for text messages in the US, it's very hard to do now, which stinks for me as an attacker. <laughs> um, but uh, in terms of spoofing phone calls, that's just software that I can use. Now, sp stopping the ability to receive spoofed calls, there are apps that you can use. You can Google things like RoboKiller, and there's a bunch of other apps that make it so it's really hard to receive spammy phone calls. Davin, what's the future of pen testing? Again, zero network, zero trust applications. Like what does your next 10 years look like or five years or one year? Um, so I think we touched on it um, earlier that, you know, zero trust is, is a great concept, uh, but is it is one of, you know, one mindset and, um, you know, it's not the easiest to implement, uh, whether it's budgets or 
like we talked about getting everyone on the same page. Uh, I haven't had to test any just yet, but, uh, and, but, but Rachel, you can, you can correct me if I'm wrong, or you can jump in here, but I, I would still probably look for doing things like fishing and testing different components. So I would test, you know, how is the MFA correct, uh, configured properly, or is there a way I can brute force the uh, multi-factor authentication? Um, you know, what, what components are there use are they using? Uh, you know, one thing like I've been working on a lot over the last few years is the API pen testing and API hacking because um, APIs are are the way of the future now with, with a lot of applications. And you know, because APIs are you know uh, inherently created to give out a lot of information, you know, it, it, it it's it's my best friend usually, uh, even in even even in the error messages. So I would still look at different components. I would still look. I would I wouldn't change too much. Um, I, obviously, you know, if it is a zero trust network, you have to be very careful um what you're doing um to make sure that you don't get detected but i don't think there's too much that i would really change i think it would just probably be how how i go about it yeah. i'm gonna open this oh, go ahead rachel oh, i was gonna say something that comes to mind for me is um, something that we're seeing changing in kind of the social engineering pen testing space is that it's moving away from just testing via email threats and also testing phone vishing sms mm -hmm. Uh, text message, chat, like Slack, uh, gaining access to a Slack is so important for me when I'm attacking. And things like attacking over social media, you know, the, the power to be able to DM somebody on their work machine on LinkedIn, and they're going to click that malicious link straight from LinkedIn. So really just widening the attack surface and, and help, helping people understand you know, I'm not just going to fish you. I'm not just going to send an email based threat. It's going to be all these other attack vectors and understanding um, the methods that we use to uh, to do an account takeover through support channels. Right, That's a huge part I, of the- yeah. um, Well, one thing that I think um, in this future pen testing that might be a little depressing and chess players will recognize what I'm about to say and that's that automation is the future, like um, building, using things like supervised machine learning to take training sets and figure out when I lob this at you, here's what happens. That it will be so efficient that there won't be a need for human pen testers very soon for the same reason that if chess is your game, uh, no human can ever come close to what a computer can do in playing chess, you just can't. So the idea that we'll have human pest te pen testers even five years from now seems silly to me. I think it's going to be, that's frightening because the pen testing can become quite malicious. I worry about um, places where uh, the training sets span say billions of people. I won't mention countries here, but you can think of a place where maybe privacy is not an issue and you can develop training sets on how people respond to different types of things or businesses, you can build some pretty significant uh, offensive weapons to do pen testing. And as Rachel and Davin will attest, a pen, one person's pen test is another person's attack weapon. When it's done by responsible folks, like we have here on the panel, it's great. But when it's in the hands of the wrong people, it could be a problem. So I think that automation in particular um, autonomous uh, AI-based processing, just using simple supervised, you can use regression algorithms to work fine, just speed training. And, and that's where pen testing will go. And it worries me because I, I don't think we're ready for that. And it's one of the biggest risks that I see in our industry, this idea that automated offensive weapons are going to get quite lethal very quickly. Um, I mean, I've seen, I mean, we deal with a lot of automated stuff um, right now but i i feel like it all depends on the type of pen test i mean we're always going to need someone like rachel right uh you you're not going to be able to figure that you know automate all of all of a social engineering or a phishing attempt at, le at least in my opinion um you know there are yeah there are certain things you can automate in a pen test but uh, because there's so many attacks happening there's always a new vulnerability or, or or a vulnerability that we knew of years ago like like log 4j where we we knew something about it but didn't know the impact until how many years later uh it's hard to 
implement all of that in in an automation tool so that's just my i i feel like there's always going to at least be someone who's going to have to be there to to, to oversee i'm it. an old guy i've seen the patterns like i remember ken thompson and others at bell labs when i started work uh, the claim was to never possibly be a computer that can beat a human in chess and also remember my own career uh, Edgar Dykstra and others talking about software development. If you've seen no code PaaS platforms now, you've got people writing software who don't know the first thing about software because it's essentially programmed. So I just keep an eye on that. I know when pen testing is in your blood, it's something that you figure there's no way a computer could possibly be uh, clever enough to do, but a computer is clever enough to do all cases, including the clever ones. So I'd keep an eye on that. I, I do think that this is something that's ripe for automation and um, you know, scanning an attack surface, trying all possibilities. That seems very doable to me. And, and modern, uh, like the, old, the idea that AI is a lot of hooey is no longer valid. Just go look at Stanford CS229, look at the syllabus, learn the algorithms, and you can see many of them will apply absolutely directly to this problem. So keep an eye on that. If you're listening to us today and you're interested in pen testing, this is a, an advance that you should keep an eye on, especially if you play defense. I think we should come back together in five years. We'll put a time on the calendar <laughs> and we can come back together and we can see what predictions we made. I'm curious to see if a computer, I mean, we know that computers can do OSINT, open source intelligence. Right. I, I leverage computers in Multigo um, to be able to help me. Now those inputs, the Google dorks that we use, the pretext development, the actual phone calls that we place, the emulation, um, those pieces, maybe a computer will be able to sound just like me and attack just like me. Maybe it'll sound like more, more like Siri or something like that, but we'll see. I mean, human-based attacks, somebody walking into your office, pretending to be IT, getting you to do X, Y, or Z. Um, I can't imagine a robot beep booping their way in and, and convincing someone, but you never know. I mean, I'm not... My eyes are open. I'm I'm ready to see what the future holds. I think there's plenty that will be automated and there's plenty that I, AI can do, but there will always be humans uh, at the helm and behind a lot of these things. Yep. We'll see. Don't we should be back the, together in five years. Well, also, don't forget, and he, he says this as the representative, the CTO from the cybersecurity vendor, um, how, how useful these techniques can be in, on the defense side. Right? When you see uh, someone's account, you see Brian's account, accessing data that I've never looked at before, coming from a device I've never used, coming from a location I've never been. And you put all of those together, there's lots of ways that you can start to identify patterns of misbehavior. And machine learning is only as good as the data that you have going in. So what's the behavior that you're monitoring? Is it just the perimeter or is, the is it the data itself and how reliable are those streams? Um, there is something I wanna bring up because this got asked a couple of different ways. Um, and so I'm gonna throw this out to everybody. Maybe I'd be start with you, but I think uh, Dom and Rachel, you, can, you have a lot to add to this. So, uh, and I'm, I'm gonna rephrase this question a little bit. Let's assume for a second that you as an organization are as secure as you can possibly be, but we don't live in a world where you're completely isolated. How do you deal with the reality that your partners, your vendors, your supply chain may not be anywhere near as secure you are? No matter what uh, investments you make in security, we're still doing business and communicating and collaborating with people and organizations outside. So how do you deal with that as a social engineer, as a pen tester, and as a CISO? How do we manage our, 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 our kind of the third party relationships and supply chain that we have? Well, you're using the right verbs. You said deal, <laughs> manage, you know, it's all these sort of soft verbs where everybody listening here knows that that's a big problem. I mean, if you throw something over the fence to a third party, um, you either do it with them and monitor them every step of the way, or you give them some rope and you say, I need you to, I need to trust you to do X, Y, Z. And we said a few minutes ago that zero trust is all about not doing that. So, mm -hmm. so this bit like sending questionnaires is not the way to go. And even contracts are arguably not, not the best way to do it. It just, I think what happens is um, over time, everyone raises their game and you'd like to think that the ones that are kind of bad at it will do worse in contracting, <laughs> use them less than the ones who are better. That's why I like these cyber risk uh, registries that um, you know do some sort of review and they try and provide some guidance. It's better than nothing, but everybody here knows that this is really huge problem. And the, the best I can tell you is that you should assume nothing 
and don't use questionnaires as the basis for doing risk management. You probably need to be a little bit more actively involved. And, you know, it's beyond the scope of this discussion to get into all the techniques, but it is a big problem. And, you know, don't get me started on fourth party, you know, so it, it's a gigantic, I don't have the answer to that. Other than we do what you said, you deal with it, you manage it, you do a bunch of stuff to reduce the risk and you just cross your fingers that uh, you've done enough. All right, I like this I one thought. too. Go ahead, Rachel, before I move yeah. on to the next one. Um, so something that I've tried to do actively in the work that I do with my clients is, and I'll say, well, what if the vendors that we're using send us an invoice and they're compromised and we pay these attackers, right? There's this principle that I say called being politely paranoid, which you've ever heard me speak before, you're probably sick of at this point. But being politely paranoid is just my fancy way of saying, use two methods of communication to confirm someone is who they say they are before you send them money or do any other sensitive action, like send over a very essential deck, give them ac admin access or whatever you're going to do. So it's tough, I'm not gonna lie, in practice to take that extra one minute out and call up the the group that sent you the invoice and say, quick question about that invoice before we go ahead and send that over. And they say, yeah, no problem. How can I help? Or we didn't send you an invoice today for that amount. It sounds like we have a problem. And what's kind of cool is I work with a large tech company that can't be named, um, but super large tech company. You've used them. All of us have used them. And they employed this for their finance team. And they were able to catch three compromised vendors just within one quarter after implementing this be politely paranoid method. And you might be thinking, okay, well, there's probably a lot that slipped by. And sure, there were. But you catch three, right? That's stopping $150,000 every single time or something like that. Um, so that's really cool. And that, in addition to making sure that you talk to your vendors and your teams and everybody that you work with, making sure they're using long, random, and unique passwords stored in a password manager. They're using a multi-factor authentication method that matches their threat model. If they had admin access, it should be a FIDO security key. And making sure that you stay up to date with those expectations with those folks just goes a long way. Um, and we can't solve everything. Nothing's going to be perfect, but we can make a dent in it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I, I want to let Rachel go first because I was actually going to say, well, someone on this panel says be, be politely paranoid. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I agree 100%. And yeah, third parties are always scary. So yeah, you know, having that communication, having that, you know, multi-factor confirmation uh, that, <laughs> that, that Rachel talked about, I think that would definitely help. Um, and yeah, using things like password managers, multi-factor authentication, you know, things of that nature kind of goes back to everything that we've talked about as far as like inventory, lease privileges, following, you know, access controls and things of that uh, nature. So that's pretty much. Keep in mind that sometimes your third party is 20 times bigger than you or 2000 times bigger than you. And when they send you as a, as a, the, you know, you're the buyer, you know, this is how we do business. Like when you use office 365, when was the last time you got somebody from Microsoft on a phone? <laughs> like never. <laughs> you do it the way they say to do it. Rachel's right. When you can control it, really, really good advice. You know, when there's the opportunity to do it, I think everybody should write that down. I, I like Rachel's suggestion. But she knows that I know sometimes, you know, you're, you're dealing with City Hall. So, <laughs> so on those, the flip side of that, though, and uh, this, this is going to be our last question. Thank you, everybody. If we didn't get to it, sorry. We had a lot of great ones that came in. Um, I, I'm going to ask one more question, but before I do, I want to remind everybody, or not remind, because I don't think I've said it yet. Um, we've talked. We've kind of talked a little bit around what's going on in the rest of the world today. Um, but if you want to learn more, Matt Radelak, who runs the Veronis Incident Response and Cloud Architecture Team, hosts the State of Cybercrime. Um, and we're doing a we're doing a special one on Monday at noon. So because uh, I've seen some questions come in about what's going on, we're going to address that totally separately. But to address what uh, Ed just said, sometimes your you know your third parties are huge. We had a great question that came in that came in that I'd like you all to answer. How do you convince management that we are? How was this worded? This was worded perfectly. Shoot, now I lost it. How do you convince management that you're not too small to be a target? I've heard this before too. We're too small. Nobody's going to care. Right. So, Ed, what would you say? And then let's go Davin and Rachel and we'll finish up. Well, pen testing actually is a good idea there. Like if you have a management team that's kind of clueless, then I love bringing someone like Rachel or Davin in and making it visually sort of visceral for them. That's 
that's a really good way to shake somebody into believing and understanding that it's a problem. I'm glad you said smaller because bigger companies now, as much as you like to poke at board members, I do it all the time and I've been one. So I, for the most part, I don't think you have to convince them. They may not be making the greatest decisions, but that's not the problem. It's more prioritization. Smaller companies, I think a pen test is a great idea. Yeah, um, I definitely think pen testing, not just because I'm a pen tester, but um, I, I agree. I think that pen testing is, is probably the best option. Um, and, you know, typically we when we when we deal with small companies or when when I've dealt with small companies in the in the past, it's kind of like weapons free. Right. I and mean, obviously within the scope and rules of engagement, but it's kind of like we want to show them that it can happen to you because a lot of people, even even in the general public today, why do I need a VPN? Why do I need to use this? Why do I need to use that? I, I it's just it's just little old me. I, it, it, nothing can happen to me. Um, anybody can be a victim. So um, you definitely want to make sure you you pen test, uh, you know, have an effective pen test and communicate that effectively as well, um, because sometimes you, you hand in the pen test report and they're like, OK, that's great. And they just kind of move it off to the side and, you know, see you next year. Um, so I think, communi you know, communicating and having that pen tester or pen test team communicate what's the worst thing that could possibly happen um, in a term that they can understand. Usually you stand to lose a lot of money <laughs> if, uh, you know, if, if we were, if this were to happen from, from a real, a real threat actor um, and for a small business, they don't really have a lot of that money to deal with or deal with the insurance or anything like that. So uh, that's usually a good motivator. Yeah. And if you, don't have the budget or you don't have the time or management or resources to bring in a pen tester, you can even just look up like, how would I hack you? I have some demos online about how I look up on social media, um, what types of emails I would send you, what type of calls you might receive. And a lot of times when people understand like, okay, I've actually never thought about it in terms of the fact that people know that we use these XYZ specific tools. These are the types of emails that they would send. Got it. I see exactly how easy it would be to fall for something like this. And it's sometimes it's just a lack of education yeah. or hubris. You know, you never know. But uh, it's helpful if you have kind of an adversarial group that's like, ah, I'm not interested in that. And if, as a security team, you feel like I'm having trouble getting through to them and a pen test just feels too heavy handed. You can just walk through like, how would we hack you? What would that sound like? What would that look like? And if they're like honest with themselves, they'd probably say, yeah, I'd fall for that. Let's, what do we do about it? It got said it in a couple of times in the chat. A hundred grand from you is a hundred grand you know, uh, from a big company too. So with that, uh, thank you all so much. This has been fantastic. Thank you all for taking some time to join us today. I hope it's been useful for everybody. Uh, we're going to be doing this again once a quarter, a uh, different group of panelists next time. But I think we're going to get back together in five years and answer some of these predictive questions because that's going <laughs> to be fun for me. Put it on the calendar. Yeah, we've got to let everybody go. Uh, it's the top of the hour now. Thank you all so much. Thanks for joining us and uh, take care. Stay safe.